Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic and part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. It is Olympics week. Just uh, finished watching the opening ceremony. Uh, congratulations for Naomi Osaka for the great honor of uh, lighting the torch. And um, that, was, that was cool to just see a tennis player do that. And let's start by talking about what the Olympics means in the in the tennis landscape. I think we're we're lucky to be a sport where uh, we send our best best athletes for the most part to the games, and uh, a lot of a lot of sports can't say that professional sports uh, because the Olympics are not prioritized. But uh, I think it's a it's a very nice every four years uh, time in the schedule. Well, it's interesting how it evolves, how the Olympic uh, event. Let's tell you, what I think it's most value is in development around the world. When tennis became an Olympic sport again, as a test sport in 1984, as a real sport in 88, it legitimized tennis as a sport in a great many countries. So that made it something that a lot of young athletes and their families and coaching infrastructure wanted to do. And so the, the countries that have entered tennis more in the last 30 years could well be the result of the, of the Olympics. That's a really good point. I, I was watching something about China and it was it was just that their foray into tennis, which has been maybe not as successful as as they hoped it would be outside of Lina was because of the Olympics. I think it's something that probably means more to certain nations than it does other nations and Serbia has a, a ton of national pride as do many of the Balkan nations. And it probably means a lot. And, and that's why Novak is going to all this trouble, um, traveling there in the middle of a pandemic with a games that are fraught with problems um, and really putting himself out there and, and doing it with a great attitude and going to win, trying to win the gold. As a, as a legacy piece, obviously Novak uh, doesn't have that gold medal that Nadal was able to capture in 2008, that Federer has not in singles, but in doubles. Um, and, you know, Djokovic has, the, the loss in 2016 to Del Potro was a, a crushing one. You could, you could see it on his face and he still talks about it to this day, but one of the hardest defeats in his career. Um, like it does, you're right, Amy, it, it means a lot to Novak, it always has. And when he was asked, why did you go? He said, it came down to, to national pride in representing my country. Well, let's remember that one of the biggest things that set Novak in motion in his great, his great run that began in 2011, maybe, maybe really began at the end of 2010 when he led Serbia to win the Davis Cup for the first time. And again, it's a, it's a young nation, the pride, the, the significance, the passion, his significance in that country. I mean, he, he's more significant in Serbia than Federer is in Switzerland where Nadal is in Spain. I mean, Federer is kind of global, but the importance of Novak Djokovic to Serbia is a big thing. Remember when Novak's dad said, I don't know, it might've been six, nine months ago, uh, Novak will have all the records when he's done. And, and at the time people thought it was very impolitic, um, but so far, everything that he said is happening is would happen is coming true. So I think there's something um, almost like it ain't bragging if you can back it up about that. And um, I think back to other sports, and I know that our listeners aren't really familiar with American baseball, but one of the one of the most famous uh, things that happened in all of sport was when Babe Ruth called his own shot that he was going to hit a home run. He pointed to the outfield and he stepped in and he did hit a home run. So it, it reminds me a little of that. And, and I think it's kind of a cool thing to watch. For sure. I know, of course, Djokovic going for the golden slam here. Only Steffi Groff has achieved that. Even the, even the calendar slam, I was talking to Steve Flink on, on Monday Match Analysis this week, and he kind of pointed out something that I hadn't thought of, which is that Nadal and Federer haven't really gotten particularly close to, uh, to even winning the, the Grand Slam because in 2009, when Federer won Roland Garros, he had already lost in Australia. And then the year Nadal won in Australia, no, that was 2000, wait, 
the year Nadal lost or won in Australia, he actually lost at Roland Garros. So it was yeah. kind of flipped there. None of them have had that, oh, wait, there's a chance. This could be the Grand Slam. So right now, Djokovic in kind of uncharted territories. But but this Olympics thing adds, you know, okay, now it can be the golden. Um, Joel, how do you look at the Olympics when it comes to the the legacy of a, of a player, obviously you can't control whether or not you're dominating in an Olympic year or not. Well, I mean, one of the things to recall from Graf's run is that the Olympics came after she'd already won the four majors. So in 88, so that added like a bit of icing to the cake. And I think the golden slam, it's, it's a nice term. Um, I think the Olympics, it does, it's, it does, if you don't win it, I'm not, if, if let's pretend, let's say Novak doesn't win it and he goes on to win the U.S. Open, or he doesn't, it's not going to tarnish his legacy to say, well, Novak, he never won gold at the Olympics. So to me, the Olympics is a great event to have played if he won. And if he does that, in a way, though, there's a certain part of me, I think the Golden Slam, certainly it's neat, but I'm okay with the Grand Slam itself. You know, I'm okay. I'm okay with it being joining Labor and Don Budge and Maureen Connolly and uh, and Margaret Court. That's, that's I mean, I, I think of... Groff's Golden Slam, she was so dominant the year, I believe she lost two matches, that it was just like another piece of the resume. So it's okay, it's neat, it's nice. I wish, I wish the Olympics had been made a team event, similar to a World Team Tennis format, like Billie Jean King and World Team Tennis created. So then think of the Olympic gold medal came down to Serbia versus Switzerland. And you had Novak, and let's say Annie Ivanovich versus you know, Federer and Hingis. And then it's a showcase of the sport and it still has its, but it's in the team, somewhat, somewhat similar, but even more emotional than the Hopman Cup was. That's what I wish the Olympics had become. I that. agree. To, to the mainstream fan, I think that would be more popular. I think that would get more people who don't watch tennis to, to watch tennis in the Olympics. I've never, and I've never done enough exploration to find out how and why that became the case. Like why wasn't the Olympics tennis event made a team event? But I think that would be really, uh, that would make, that would bring a whole other level of engagement. Yeah, I agree. That would be fun, but it's not that way. And, um, you know, the, the back, backing up for a second, the one that I always think of is Serena going for the calendar Grand Slam and missing it. And that was, what, 2015? That was a lot of drama and a lot of buildup. But you're right. Like, let's say he, for some reason, it's best of three and it's strange or whatever. Let's say Novak doesn't win the Olympics. It's a smart gambit. It's a smart play because it really doesn't matter and he can just go on his merry way and, and continue with what he's doing. Um, so I, it's outside of just the effort and the work um, and the flying around the world and all that, I think it's a really smart play. And of course, I'm fascinated to see what will happen. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, interesting factors here. Of course, after Wimbledon, Djokovic said, I'm actually 50-50 on this after really sounding for, for most of the last couple of years, hell bent on prioritizing the Olympics after winning Roland Garros and winning Wimbledon and no crowd in Tokyo, which really puts a, a, a damper on, on the entire event. And uh, I thought the ceremony was still impactful, uh, you know, the opening ceremony that I just watched. But uh, of course, it would have been even more impactful if there were fans in the stadium. Um, so Djokovic was 50-50 was on going here, and you start to understand and, and kind of think about how many challenges that he faces in trying to win this event. And uh, I think this could be, of all the, you know, compared to the, the Grand Slams, uh, I think this could be a bit of a, uh, I, I think it could get a bit wild with six matches in eight days in best of three format with not full entourage and no crowd and weird uh, living conditions in the Olympic village. It, it seems like, um, it seems like this is going to be hard for Djokovic compared to, I don't know, winning Wimbledon. Uh, would, would you guys agree with that? Wait, that this is going to be harder, harder, harder compared to Wimbledon? 
Yeah, like, I think so. I think the the odds you think I think the odds that he wins are a little bit lower than Wimbledon. Consider what about the fatigue as well of just what he's been. Different, okay, that's a different. That's a different question. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess, I mean, Wimbledon. You know, Wimbledon, Wimbledon. You know, now that he's won Wimbledon, yeah, he won Wimbledon. And he played well enough to win Wimbledon, but the the energy it takes to go about you know, winning a major over two weeks and seven matches. But I mean, this is. This is an intriguing event. You're right. This many matches. And then you look at his draw. First round, not that tough against um, against Delian, 139. But the second round, the, the always dangerous, perpetual floater, uh, Struff. Here he is again, right? <laughs> Slash and burn. Who knows? I mean, Struff cannot go more than three or four months without drawing Novak. And then, you know, very close to the beginning. But... Um, I think that, um, and I said this on a show like, I don't know, 10 shows ago, that if best of three were the crown jewel, like, let's say for some reason, the Masters 1000s best played best of three were, were the crown jewel of the sport, and that's what you wanted to win. And these best of five things were just like glorified exhibitions. Then our three, Novak, Rafa, and Roger, would still be the, the, the best in the sport. They would just adjust their training regimens. They'd adjust their mentality. And um, I don't, so I, Novak can do what he needs to do. Yeah, you know, there's a little bit more randomness in the best of three um, format. But um, I'm not worried about that as much as some of the little details, like not having his people around him and not having his stringer and that kind of thing. That to me is a little more because, as you guys know, when you're playing a match and things start to go south, you can start saying to yourself, you know, my racket's not strung right. If only I had my regular <laughs> stringer. And that, that thought can kind of take over. Um, and so I, I want to see how he does with that. But um, the format, nah, look, he's got this. He can do that. Of yeah. course. I Go ahead, Joel. No, you're, you're, you, I see, I hear what you're getting at, Gil, maybe the, the, the unique challenge of the Olympics and the yeah. venue and the setting and the housing and the, uh, the entourage aspect, which is less and all that. And, and also um, what's going on in Japan and, and no spectators, but uh, I guess we'll see. But at the same time, there's no, there's no downside in defeat. No, I agree with that. I, I, I agree with downside that. in defeat. It, it it would be similar to Nadal has not won any tour finals. That would be kind of a similar thing to Djokovic has no Olympic uh, singles silver or. No, gold. I think the tour final, but I think the tour finals is a much more important event than it, the yeah. Olympics. Right. It's, oh, it's really, bit, really. It's I, more, I think I think the Olympics is a little has a little bit more cachet because it's more rare. Well, it has but, cachet to it has cachet to a broader world and the other athletes. But I think in the in the tennis legacy, again, you get no demarcations on my roll book if you don't win an Olympic gold in singles. The if you don't win a tour finals, it's it's a it's not a major demarcation, but it's like hmm, that's kind of interesting. It's just of interest. It's not. It's not major. It's not like we talk about the, yeah. the four slams, but it's something it's, it speaks to something. And if you win it, and I think, I think it's a, a pretty interesting tournament to win the tour finals, but conditions, conditions have been the same for, for a decade in the, you know, at the O2 arena with the quick indoor right. hard courts with the best field that, that you can get. And it just, you know, I'm sure that that's the only thing, right. The Olympics, they, they were on grass in 2012 and they're always going everywhere so it's it's difficult to compare but i think uh i think there's room for interpretation both ways but it's kind of similar in the sense where it's like oh well that's a side note uh you know that's an interesting kind of uh wrinkle right for sh no question it's yeah they're interesting little well that's because the the significance in these three have made the slams even that much more significant because they're all more the same now. The winning of the slams isn't as boutique driven as it once was. I used to call it the, the sphere of influence era. You had your, your Moosters and your Bougueras and your clay court guys and you had your Krychiks and your Gorin. So people were, there are these different little mini empires that were happening. And now it's just like one big, like the slams, the four of them. 
and they've mm-hmm. and they've and and the success I think particularly Novak's success in Australia and Rafa's success at Roland Garros has really raised the significance of those events that much more. Yeah, made them that much more important in the whole scheme of tennis. If I'm being more clear and, and specific, by the way, about what I think will is Novak's biggest challenge here, it's certainly fatigue. I just, at, at a certain point, a man needs a break. Uh, and it's just a matter of at what point. And, and Novak hopes that point is after the Olympics and not during. Um, but, you know, we saw it like with Daniil Medvedev um, in, in 2019. It, he crashed. I mean, he was, he was really incredible. He was making the final of every single event. And then he lost first round, first round, first round for like he crashed. And, and that's going to happen if you, you can't go, you can't win every tournament and keep going with no breaks. So, um, you know, obviously Djokovic got two weeks between Roland Garros and, and Wimbledon, but I think that's his biggest enemy that for me. So I don't know. Yeah. Is that the biggest enemy? Yes, I would agree. That's the biggest. Okay. That's, that's Yeah. I mean, maybe you guys aren't ready to quite get into this, but I looking at his draw um, in his half, he's got three of the Evs. He's got Zverev, Rublev, and Karatsev. I guess Medvedev is is in the other half. Um, you know, and he's got Musetti up near his section, who took two sets off of him. So um, there's a question about. The, I mean, I know that tons of people have, have dropped out of the Olympics, but when you look at the draw, there's a lot of really good names in there. So um, that in itself is a challenge, uh, other than just the fatigue and the other factors that we talked about. Yeah, the draw looks like a really good 500 event. Like if, maybe, if not quite, or maybe even even close I think it's a thousand. Masters. Even close to a thousand. And it'll be interesting to see how these people rise to it. It's like, yeah, like I'm intrigued by... Musetti, who plays Milman in the first round, there's a total style contrast, but you've got this grinding Australia. And again, the whole advantage, your nation factor is going to play its whole thing. It plays whole role in this. So that's going to be intriguing. Yeah. As it did for Del Potro in Rio when he beat Novak there four years ago. Yeah. What's what's interesting is that, um, I think I saw that Djokovic has never played a, a major, like a Grand Slam, where either Roger or Rafa was not in the draw, so except for the 2020 U.S. Open, except for that one. So yeah. this is like, um, it's not a slam, but it's it's a tournament, high-profile tournament with a lot of cachet, and uh, both those guys aren't there. So I saw that Novak had commented on that and said it was weird. <laughs> Yep. Takes sure. us takes us back to uh, last August when we were when we were talking about that and that uh, that very strange feeling U.S. Open. But speaking of the U.S. Open and um, as we we shift gears to Roger Federer, someone who uh, is his name is entered in the open along with Nadal right now, all three on the official entry list that was released this week. Federer was also considering playing the Olympics post Wimbledon. And said, "Well, I gotta, I gotta meet with the team and 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 see how we're feeling." But um, no surprise, really, that he chose not to travel to Tokyo. The surprise is what he put in his uh, statement, which is essentially that the the knee suffered a setback and that he needs to kind of go back to uh, rehabbing that knee to get ready for the the hard court swing. Um, he didn't use the word rehab, but he oh no, he did. He I have already begun rehabilitation. Uh, in the hopes of returning to the tour later this summer. Uh, obviously, you know, it, it was, it's it's not what you want to hear because at a certain point, you'd hope that Federer shifts attention away from, okay, I'm, you know, it's, it's about the knee. I need the knee to get better and just start focusing on, you know, I'm going to be on the practice courts and I'm going to be working on my tennis. Uh, so, I, I mean, what are, uh, what are your takeaways, Joel, from, from Federer saying that the the knee suffered a setback during the grass season. Yeah, that was intriguing to see. I mean, I don't know how extensive the setback is. We'll never know. And uh, maybe that's what obviously affected him in his quarterfinal loss. But uh, I'm even surprised. I'm a little even surprised he even said that, that he felt the need to even say that. I think he could have just said, I'm, I'm not playing the Olympics 
this year so I can and focus on other things. And, and no one would have minded, you know, he's going to turn 40 and all that. But he wanted to be kind of a disclose it. And uh, I guess we're going to have to see. We're going to have to see now he comes to the hard court. So each of these little surfaces, we've seen kind of the state of Roger, the clay Roger, the grass Roger. The hard, now comes the hard court Roger. And he certainly hasn't been over tennis. So it's just a question of where the where the body really is. I think hearing that, first of all, it didn't surprise me because he made a comment in week one at Wimbledon when he was asked about the Olympics and he said, we're going to have to sit down and see how the, and, and it almost seemed like he was going to say how the knee was doing, but then he stopped himself and kind of made it more generic. And, and what the whole episode made me wonder as I reflect back on Wimbledon and, and the French Open and, and Rogers runs there, it makes me wonder if the knee has ever really been 100%. And if he views um, all this, all his time since coming back as just one big rehabilitation. Um, but the good thing is, is that he, he's still trying to rehab it. He's not like, um, you know, I just can't do this anymore. He's, he's not, as far as we know, getting a cortisone shot so that he can play one last match. He seems to really care about rehabbing it in phases. So um, I think it's good news. And, and he's also entered it in Cincinnati. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, after the Hurricatch match, where a lot of people were thinking retirement, um, you know, Amy, you cut a promo for, for Roger that he's not going anywhere. <laughs> and I, I was kind of with you because my, my biggest point was that a loss to her catch is not going to set him back psychologically. He's not going to be like, oh, this is, I, I, I didn't win this match. Okay. I, I must be, I must be on the way out. Right. Or I must be done. Um, psychologically, that kind of loss, he's going to move past that very easily. I'm starting to get worried if he's going to be able to move past this knee thing physically. And, and I'm, you know, just as each time, each time he's kind of comes back and then, and then has to take more time off. I get a little bit more concerned because the stop, start, stop, start, it's not going to allow him to get to the level he wants. So this is the first time just with, with the knee resurfacing again, no pun intended, uh, where I, I am starting to uh, have questions about, about Rod and just concern because I really just hope uh, obviously that it heals to, to the fullest extent and he can just go back to, again, playing on, on the tour regularly. But I, I'm, um, I'm worried that the knee is going to really affect the next, uh, until, he, until he stops playing, basically. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that loss. See, so here's the question. Is it the loss to the high rank player that shows you, ah, I don't got it anymore. There's the less the lower rank player that says, wow, this is who I'm losing to. I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing in the, in the mindset of the player. And maybe it's how the tennis goes. I mean, that, that final set of that match was, uh, was not exactly a, a great showcase of, of Roger. And of course, and who wants to lose their last match of Wimbledon by that score, the bagel in the this final set in the last set. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. I guess it'll be interesting to see again and the extent again. The I thought that for the last few years, even before the 2020 stuff, that Federer was being very deliberate about how he managed his body and his energy and even the way he played points and just very smart about that, about how much what his all out can be. He was definitely going to go all out, but how how much and where and his scheduling, all that stuff. Well, you know, when I said that, that I didn't think that he was going to retire, I meant right then or right now. And the I'm not making any kind of a bold prediction. I'm just listening to him. He was asked point blank a couple of times, are you going to retire now? And he was like, no, I'm, I'm in rehab. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm still coming back from the knee. I mean, he said that in the uh, post uh Wimbledon press conference after he lost to her catch. Um, and then he, he said, I've, I've got to figure out how I can be more competitive. And it just, if you listen to him and you take him at his word, it doesn't sound like a guy who's going to retire, especially when he says he's not. So I'm not doing anything other than just listening to him. Well, that's the best. I like that. And I, I, it gets to our running joke about the press conference where 
the reporter asked that, and, the, and do we really think any athlete, much less Roger Federer, you know, I hadn't thought of it. How did you mention it? You mention it, you know, uh, seven minutes into this press conference after I lost, you know what? Yeah, thank you. I'm retiring today. Hello. <laughs> I mean, my geez. And that's where the whole, that's where the whole question about that stuff, like, and, and the reporter, well, I'm obligated to ask. This is what people want to know. Speaks to some real poor skills on the part of journalists. I mean, we know it's, 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 out, it's extant. They'll know. They'll know. I mean, there's, no, you know, there's enough management going on in the world of sports these days that they'll know. It's like this reporter's going to get the scoop. Roger Federer, yeah, I'm retiring now. I mean, I would actually, I would love, I would love a player to actually do it that way. Now that you mention it. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's see. I think that would be a Medvedev move or maybe a Bublik move. Yeah. I think, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. A Bublik, a Bublik or a Medvedev, who, who, by the way, speaking of them, they, uh, they play one another in the first round of the Olympics so they can yeah. have a nice little show of it. Maybe one of them can announce their retirement after their win. I won this match. I'm retiring. I mean, just kind of turn the world upside down. I mean, this stuff, look, we know when, when, when Federer wants it to be time, it will be done precisely the way he wants it, where he wants it, when he wants it, and whether it's like Agassi did it one year after, at, after he lost at Wimbledon and said, it'll be this summer. He announced like a little, a little mini summer farewell tour. Edberg did it for a whole year and regretted doing it that way like a whole one year road show. Others don't even, and again, in an individual sport, you don't, you don't even have to announce it. It's not like you have to file papers to the league. You just aren't playing. It'll be interesting. I, we've talked about it before. It'll be interesting to see what he decides to do there. Uh, but um, we are, of course, um, looking very much forward to Novak Djokovic going for his first career singles gold and to continue what has been a magically dominant year for the Serbian. And he will be uh, full of pride and motivation and focus in Tokyo as, uh, as he looks to conquer that while Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal um, are, are home watching. Nadal will, uh, will be our next to play in Washington, DC. So I know the Nadal coverage has been, Limited over the last uh, couple of weeks, but uh, we will we will get on the Nadal train right after the Olympics, of course. And uh, for now, um, again, very intrigued to see what Djokovic does. That'll do it for this episode of Three. We're available on all podcast platforms. Make sure you follow, you subscribe, you leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're watching on YouTube, like the video, leave a comment and subscribe. We will see you next time on the next episode of Three.